This is a Lessons of the Sixties interview. Uh, my name is Ann Gallivan. This project is a project of the Institute for Policy Studies uh, to record the activities of people who lived in the Washington, D.C. area in the 60s and 70s and participated in the Civil Rights Movement, the Peace Movement, and the Women's Movement. Um, Russell Belcher is our camera person. Um, I am Ann Gallivan doing the interviewing, and this is Lillian Peterson Hertz who um, was a student at Georgetown beginning in the 60s. So uh, how did you end up in, in Washington, D.C., uh, whatever year you came in the 60s, Lillian? I came to Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. It was the only school for that particular study in the United States at the time. And I had been challenged by President Kennedy in my high school years to do for my country. So what better place than Washington, D.C.? And I came in 1965 as part of the first class of women, first group of women uh, accepted into that Foreign Service school. And I was there until 69 when I graduated. And um, how did you personally get the social justice bug? Really, it came from my family. We, uh, my parents were both pacifists and their parents before them. And uh, we were always aware of what was going on in the world, even though we lived in a very remote community in Northern California, now rather well known, Paradise, California. Huh. And at the time it was a small town and uh, there were just lots of good people there who had come in to, to come to live there from really escaping cities elsewhere, mostly on the East Coast. And uh, pe there were people who cared about community. So I felt like I grew up in a very uh, loving and pleasant community. And uh, I had a family that was uh, concerned about world affairs and interested in what was going on in the world. And I had uh, the influences of, uh, well, my family's pacifism. My father had a, a disability. He had an artificial leg from his youth and, uh, and yet uh, was able to uh, have a family and um, pay attention to the world and, and care a lot. Um, I also had, uh, I went to Sunday school as a young child, and one of my teachers was Mrs. Hanke, who, I don't know if you know of Hanke's Natural Juices, but they were here on the East Coast in Washington when I first got here, and it was that family produced them in Paradise, California, natural, organic uh, fruits and juices. And, uh, and old Mrs. Hankey was my Sunday school teacher, and she taught us about loving one another. <laughs> so you came primed to Washington, D.C. to be a political activist of some sort. Originally, you were thinking that you'd go in the State Department. But how did you find yourself, Lillian, then involved in the Civil Rights Movement and then the Peace Movement in Washington, D.C.? Tell us some stories about how you got involved with those things. Well, one other factor that I'd like to mention about my upbringing was a high school civics teacher, Virginia Franklin, who was uh, attacked by the John Birch Society for teaching us about all forms of government, including communism and socialism. And she fought for her constitutional right in the courts and this was during my high school years, and we were very proud of her. And she became famous enough to be on the front cover of Life magazine, and then went to teach at Berkeley, at the University of California at Berkeley. So her example was huge. And when I got to Georgetown, I wanted very much to get involved with things that made a difference, with activities that made a difference. So, you know, as a freshman, you get to you get lots of information about what's going on on campus. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that caught my eye was the Georgetown University Community Action Program, GUCAP. 
And I checked it out, and sure enough, they were busy doing things, and they were interesting things. Like, what were they doing? Well, first I got involved in tutoring, mm -hmm. and that was okay, but it, it uh, wasn't very, it wasn't particularly dynamic. But mm -hmm. I did learn uh, my way off campus into the, what is now the Martin Luther King, well, up until a few days ago, the Martin Luther King Library. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at that time, now it's the Carnegie Library again. But anyway, I would meet my student there and, uh, and we would work together. And, uh, but soon I learned that uh, in my freshman year, the upcoming Christmas break was an opportunity to go to Albany, Georgia and work registering voters. And that really interested me. So I went, and uh, the work was with SNCC, and SNCC was say also which SNCC, SNCC is uh, the whole name of the organization, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm -hmm. and uh, there were a lot of students involved. Uh, only a handful at Georgetown, but uh, the they also SNCC was also active in D.C. in the Home Rule movement. Mm -hmm. And in, at the time, a bus boycott against the privately owned and operated O'Roy Chalks bus line. This is before the subway. Long before Metro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and people rode buses a lot in those days. But so, uh, at, at Georgetown, at, at the community action program, I met uh, J Bob Jackal, who was a big influence in mentoring us and getting us involved in these uh, community issues, and Ann Gallivan, another woman activist. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was in the uh, Civil Rights Committee a little later than you came on campus, but I remember those days, there's a lot of people who did the tutoring in the community and they got a real, real, realistic look at Washington, D.C., the rest of Washington, D.C. That's right. By doing that, because Georgetown was kind of an isolated place. In fact, let's talk a little bit about that. Describe Georgetown University in those first years when you came. What did it feel like? What did it look like to you? Well, there, I had an overwhelming experience that of the visually acute racism <laughs> The, the students and faculty were white, and the maids and janitors were black. Paradise didn't have black families. I don't know if, if it was a sundown town. It was just a small town of a few eclectic people. So I, didn't, I knew about the race issue, but I, wasn't, I hadn't experienced it. So when I got to Georgetown, there it was in, in black and white, sharp. <laughs> and the economic divisions were loud and clear. Mm -hmm. And I had been taught that, that there's a great unfairness uh, amongst, uh, for racial reasons. And there it was, I could see it. So I was anxious to not be too much a part of the white community because I didn't like that division. Um, and yet, you know, they were, they were nice people, they were good people. And uh, I tell the story of going to New York City for the first time, which was very exciting to a 17-year-old youth from the West, uh, with some dormitory roommates. And we stayed at the Waldorf Astoria, and we ordered room service, and we went by cab to the Cloisters, and we went to Greenwich Village and you know, heard some far out stuff. And um, it, was an, it was just an adventure in luxury and excitement. And uh, I realized that I needed more money if I was going to live this way. <laughs> so I signed up to babysit and, uh, and was able to earn some additional uh, spending money that way. I, my parents were already struggling to, to pay my costs. So uh, uh, Georgetown itself was a very wealthy enclave of the whole District of Columbia. Like you said, if you leave Georgetown, you quickly see another side of, of the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I worked with SNCC, uh, going to rallies for home rule and occasionally riding with the SNCC drivers, they, would, they had a, a 
station wagon that they would take around and give people rides to keep them off the buses and to, con to spread the word about the boycott and why the boycott was happening. So um, that was all very interesting. Uh, but you did seem to clue in real quickly to the, the activists of your sort that you felt comfortable with on campus at Georgetown. You identified them pretty early on, didn't you? I, I did, mm -hmm. and uh, it was really what was of interest to me, is, is a better community, working to make the community a better place. Um, I, w I was not uh, brought up to think that self-interest is paramount, even though I will, I will tell you that I believe that is what our foreign policies are based on, self-interest, and for that reason, I, I never did work with the State Department because I learned at Georgetown that, that this is the bottom line for our foreign policy is self-interest. And I had believed it was to help make the world a better place. Now, the, uh, the, the trip that really changed a lot for you was the trip to the Southwest Georgia Voting Rights Project. Can you talk a little about that? Who was there? What precisely were they doing? And what is it that they were doing that you really caught fire about? Well, they were, register they were attempting to register black voters. And uh, the reason they needed outside help was because people had been intimidated historically. Black people had been intimidated not to, uh, not to exercise their right to vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got there, we stayed in a, a SNCC Freedom House, what they called the Freedom House, which was separate from the office. There were two separate places. Mm -hmm. One was the Freedom House where we stayed and the office is where we talked about what was happening and who would go where and, and uh, shared experiences and ideas. We would drive to Moultrie. Uh, my particular uh, assignment was to go to Moultrie, a smaller town outside of Albany, to register voters. And um, I remember being stopped once in a vehicle with a black male and myself by uh, a sheriff who made us get out of the car and checked the registration in the vehicle and so forth and let us go. But I, I, while I didn't feel fear because I'd never had to, <laughs> I understand that um, others were not so lucky to be let go in, in those days in that situation. There was a night at the Freedom House that there was rumor we were going to be attacked. It didn't happen, but uh, we all had to think about what we would do. And in Moultrie, knocking on doors of a, of a dusty back road community, shack, where shack, people lived in shacks, uh, sometimes I would say, have you been down to register to vote? And the answer would come back undecipherable. Mm. <laughs> I couldn't tell if it was yes or no, and I think that was purposeful. It was a frightening prospect, especially to some of the older folks, to consider challenging the white power structure. And I saw that, and I, uh, I was uh, convinced that, uh, and have been ever since, that the right to vote is precious. Yes. Now, how long did you stay on that trip? And you made subsequent trips there too, didn't you? Yes, I think I went again during the Easter holiday. And then the following year, we went to uh, Sunflower County, Mississippi with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in, in Fannie Lou Hamer's town of Ruleville. And uh, there were incidents there that took us to court. And I'm afraid I can't quite remember what, uh, what that all was about, because my overwhelming recollection was how, uh, how Fannie Lou Hamer's community of activists and people, of black people, in spite of the oppression they faced daily, how they cared about one another. It was a real example of a caring community. And I was impressed by that, and I thought, 
later I put it into the words of being the peace you wish to see, but I thought about how they lived the beloved community that they wished to have in spite of all the challenges. So I, w <clears throat> I was impressed by that and I can't remember the details of the court case. <laughs> Well, the reason that most people recognize Fannie Lou Hamer's name is because she was the featured speaker at the Democratic Convention of 1964, right? Yes. Um, Atlantic City, I believe, and she spoke for the uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which wanted to be accepted as the official delegation. That's right. To the to the convention, and they lost that that battle. Although she got to speak to the entire. Um, the entire conference. Uh, it was quite mesmerizing. Everyone who was there or read, it, read or heard about it later were knocked out by her, her passion. Yes. She was a, she was a great lady. And you, you stayed at her house, you said, right? I stayed with a neighbor, Miss Susie, and I had never had the experience of listening to mice crawl through the paper walls through the night. But, and uh, I remember washing my hair in the cold water, run, you know, pump faucet out front in the front yard. Uh, but it was right next to the Hamer home. And uh, I remember f when we first met Fannie Lou Hamer, she was pulling a big cornbread out of the oven and we all sat down to a meal with them. We went to mass meetings there I don't remember mass meetings in Albany, but we had mass meetings in Sunflower County. Right, in churches primarily, correct? In churches, yes. Right. Now, why do you think they had all those meetings in churches? To come together, mm -hmm. to, t to um, hear each other, to give each other support, because they were doing very brave um, actions to <laughs> just go down and try and register to vote and or to speak up to the white people. To, to demand their rights, their constitutional rights, but in these meetings, they they would issues would be explained and um, and their rights would be clarified and ways of interacting could be suggested and uh, it gave people strength to come together. Now all these uh, voting right, registration projects and the people like you who went down there. We're basically working toward what became the uh, voting rights and, and uh, civil rights bills that were that were passed by the by well with the Johnson administration in 1965. Uh, they were two of the biggest bills that affected the lives of people, black people in particular, in the South. Um, and the one thing that we all came together about right before those bills were signed, and after all the projects you talked about had been shown to the American people via television and other things. Um, the big thing we did was we had the Selma March, which was a, co a coalition of hundreds of, of dozens really of organizations fighting for voting rights. Uh, so you would have just, would you have just arrived for that or did, did you go on that? I did not. I, w I only went to uh, Mississippi and Georgia. Mm -hmm. I do believe that had already taken place. The Selma yeah, March. The, the Selma March was March 1965, and the civil rights and the voting rights bills were, were signed right after that, but it was considered the culminating march, a, success, a successful march for these particular bills, uh, which are now being threatened by <laughs> Trump's uh, Justice Department. Anyway, back to Georgetown for a bit. You spent time in the South. You were really changed by that. But um, do you remember Father McSorley at Georgetown? Sure, I do. Tell, was, talk about him a little bit. He's kind of a famous guy at Georgetown. But he's, he's, well, he's, yes, he was a weighty professor and priest, an older fellow who had been uh, spiritual advisor and, and personal priest to President Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a seminar uh, which I felt very fortunate to get into, a seminar on issues of a just war. Is there such a thing as a just war? Issues of war and peace. And uh, it really was a wonderful exploration of what, 
war does, how, how we can develop alternatives that, uh, and the need for a just peace and how justice issues are so wrapped up in whether or not wars can be avoided or not. Um, it really strengthened my resolve as a pacifist that, that war, we should have war never again. And it, but it also gave me the understanding that the need for justice was great. So I uh, met people in that class that I admired. I um, felt a great deal of resolve. And Father McSorley even came to one of our SNCC parties down at 14th and U, Northwest, which shortly thereafter erupted in flames Mm -hmm. uh, after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Do you uh, remember that day that he was, it was in the evening he was assassinated. Where were you and what happened to you and what did you take home from that? My recollection is that we were coming back from uh, uh, Georgia mm -hmm. and that uh, we heard about it on the radio and we went to the roof of Healy Hall <laughs> Healy Hall is what? It's a, a tall building, an old building at Georgetown, the, the stone with towers. And mm -hmm. we found access to the roof and could look out and see where, where the fires were burning in D.C. And of course, we felt the sadness and, and anger of the assassination. Do you remember that the city was under a curfew for several days? I do. Uh, did that keep you on campus, basically? Or, or I don't remember it being a problem. I probably had studies to catch up with after having been away. Yeah. But well, I was living off campus my uh, sophomore year. I mentioned earlier that because I needed more spending money, mm -hmm. I started babysitting. And mm -hmm. I ended up babysitting for a young family in Georgetown who invited me to come live with them uh, my sophomore year. And I accepted that offer. Now the rules were that you were to stay in the dormitory for the first two years of your schooling at Georgetown. But because I was signing in and out of the dormitory to go do all of these activities with SNCC, mm -hmm and black people, I had been called into the dean's office where she gently encouraged me to find better pastimes. Really? And as a young co-ed at Georgetown. And I knew that they didn't really uh, want me there so much um, because, you know, this funky old station wagon would pull up to the dorm and I'd sign out that I was going to a home rule rally <laughs> mm -hmm. and get into a car with a bunch of black folks and go to the rally. Well, uh, when this family that I liked and I enjoyed their three-year-old daughter um, asked me to live there, it was to everyone's uh, happiness to bend the rules a little and let me move off campus early. <laughs> Did they support what you did, the family that you lived with? They did. And as a matter of fact, they were the Fields, Martin and Barbara Field. And their daughter, Jennifer, was my three-year-old charge. And one Sunday morning, there was a protest at St. Matthew's Cathedral, right down off Connecticut Avenue. And we were on the steps of the cathedral during the Sunday morning mass to encourage the bishops to... Uh, stand against the war in Vietnam and Jennifer was with me I had her that morning and we got we made the front page of the Washington Post the next day her parents saw her and they were thrilled <laughs> they were against the war as well well let's move into the, um, the war here um, so many people yourself included um, sort of worked in the civil rights movement and then found themselves inevitably getting involved in anti-war activities. So what was your story with anti-war work? After your identification with the civil rights movement, you had a lot of experience there. How did you drift into the anti-war? 
uh, crowd and what did you do? Well, I have a vivid memory of the Six Day War uh, of Israel against the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And we were in Mississippi at the time doing our civil rights work. And I remember Bob Jackal's re reaction to that news, uh, uh, how, ups how it upset him. And of course, having been a pacifist, I didn't care for any war, but I didn't know a whole lot about the Middle East at that point. And so realized that there's a whole lot of the world I need to learn about. And the next thing I hear is there's uh, all of my friends are getting draft notices <laughs> to go fight a war in Vietnam. Well, where's that and why is mm -hmm. that? So um, all of those questions came up very quickly uh, about uh, the Vietnam War. Why are we fighting there? What's our interest? Who, who attacked us? Mm -hmm. So uh, as, as my male friends uh, came to grapple with their situations, uh, the, the need for education for all of us came about. And the idea came about at the time of uh, teach ins and speak outs on right. campus. That was, that 65 was the big year and 66 for teach ins. Those I think so, years. 66 and... And, and teach-ins, tell, tell people uh, who don't know about them what teach-ins are. Well, um, somebody who purports to know something will start it off and you can ask questions and mm -hmm. you can uh, have a number of speakers and you can speak yourself if you wish to. And, and uh, as I recall anyway, it was a, sort of a shared learning mm -hmm. to ask the questions, to find the answers, and uh, to share the knowledge that we had about why people were being asked to go fight in Vietnam and why this draft had been instigated. Um, we, uh, there were also speak outs in which people could just state their opinions. So both of those were, were um, teaching tools, but they weren't in the classroom. They were out on campus Mm -hmm. in the commons areas where, um, where the ideas of the day that weren't in the curriculum could be shared. And I do remember uh, of going with a friend to speak to the president of the student council, or perhaps he was senior class president, to try to gain his support for, well, who's that? Mm -hmm. uh, for a teach-in or a speak-out and we garnered his support, but he wanted no part of it, and that was Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. He would not speak against the war. He would not speak for the war. He wouldn't be a part of it, but he thought we should have the right to hold our teach-ins. So yes. that was my <laughs> brief interlude with Bill Clinton at Georgetown. Um, mm -hmm. Father Fadner was another uh, one of my he was a Russian history professor and I had his class and uh, one day I was posting, putting up a poster and noticed he was kind of coming at me with an angry look on his face so I walked away to see if that was truly the problem and he tore down the poster. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't uh, confront him, I just figured if he was that angry. I remember angry. Father Fadner, did he ever come out against the war in any way? I don't quite remember. I don't remember either. Mm -hmm. I, ju I do know that he, I believe it, it was a poster for a speak out or a teach in mm -hmm. and uh, I don't, and there was a great deal of hesitancy on the part of the administration to allow this oh, I new, remember. new thing. Yes. Yeah. I remember they were not at all um, amenable to anything that was anti-war, and there's tremendous fights among students, I don't mean physical fights, tremendous arguments among the undergraduates about the war, and particularly since so many of them were getting drafted, or would be drafted as soon as they finished. But there's, uh, it, it wasn't a settled thing at Georgetown that the war was a bad thing. I mean, a lot of people supported it. That's right. We were, we were probably in the minority, those of us who uh, did not want this war, who were anti-war. But Father McSorley helped us to ask the questions, That's helped right. us to have the right to demand, uh, to, to, to 
explore these issues. And of course, Bob Jackal was always helpful with those things. Was Jackal a Jesuit? He was a young, younger Jesuit priest. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he stayed with uh, the Jesuits or not in his later life. There was also a Jesuit at Georgetown named Jack Hoy, who was a very active for a while in the GUCAP thing and getting tutors for kids. Uh, I think he later left the order, but when he, when he was at Georgetown, he was doing very progressive things like uh, trying to get uh, housing for older people built. Uh, so the, the, the people, the Je Jesuits who were against the war were really good. They did a lot, but it wasn't overwhelmingly. Uh, On the whole, I admire the Jesuits. I yeah. got a, an excellent education mm -hmm. in terms of how to learn and, and the learning process. Uh, I, I didn't agree with a lot of the what, <laughs> but uh, but I admired uh, Bob Jackal in particular for living his values, and I saw others there as well. Mm -hmm. But he's the one I knew the best, and so uh, you know he was an example of a, a very fine man who happened to be a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the history of Jesuits, which I've I have some understanding of, there were many fine ones. Oh yes, many fine things they've done. They've done. Um, back to the anti-war movement off campus. Um, can you describe or talk about one of the big one of the there were many big demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people. Which ones did you go to, and do you have any particular memories about one or the other that you'd like to describe? What the atmosphere was, um, what you did. How you felt afterwards? Well, the one I remember most vividly is the very first one I went to in New York City. It was my second trip to New York City, and oh, what a contrast with my first trip mm -hmm. to New York City, which uh, it was a mobilization against the war. There were lots of black speakers on the um, platform. There Including were lots King. Of, uh, King was white speaker, I believe so. Yeah. And white speakers on the platform, and there were people, the the sense of common cause was palpable. It was once again mm -hmm. a very welcoming, it was a great day uh, weather-wise, and it was just a welcoming, wonderful, the speeches, the passion, the music, the, the sense of uh, solidarity. It would have been 67, right? Might have been, six, might have been spring of 67, yes, yes. probably so. Yes, that was that. That was the point at which um, um, things started to change. Before 1967, the anti-war people were considered uh, they were considered fringy and kind of out of it. You know, it was a minority position to be against the war. That parade, and then a couple of months later, in October, the Pentagon march, which was huge, changed the whole scene. In retrospect, we now know that uh, the, the 67. Axis here was the difference between a minority position and a much larger body of people being totally against the war. And it was also a lot of young men burning their draft cards that year. That's right. And so it became very militant and very aggressive that year. Um, so then there were huge demonstrations in uh, 68 and particularly 69. There was the moratorium and there was the mobilization. You were around for those, right, in 69? Yes, I was there uh, through 69, and I do remember uh, a number of large uh, anti-war rallies in D.C. I did get arrested at one of them. Um, I believe it was the March on the Pentagon. And, uh, it, you know, it kind of flows together in my mind because I've been marching against war since the 60s over and over and over again and uh, it seems endless. We're, we're in endless wars. We couldn't seem to make a difference. We now know that we made a difference, but at the time oh, it felt, often felt that nobody was listening. Well, it didn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. It mattered that I lived my life according to my beliefs and that was part of the joy of being an American, was mm -hmm. it not, that we had the freedom to have our point of view and to live our point of view. And uh, later in life, I worked with a peace tax fund and war tax resistors to try not to be a part of the 
military industrial economy. Well, thank you, Lily. And I want to ask you now, the uh, last question is all these things that you did in the 60s um, with the civil rights movement and, and the anti-war movement and, pres and presumably the women's movement as it developed, how do you think those things affected the rest of your life? And, and what have you been doing since then, essentially? Well, you speak of them as movements, and I see them as lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, as you live your life, you live your beliefs, and if you believe in people's equal rights, you, you live that to the best of your ability, and you fight for it to the best of your ability. Same for women's rights. There were, uh, I, I ultimately went into construction, home improvement, to work with my hands to make the world a better place. My, um, and to help people of modest means. My first professional job after, George, after getting my degree was as a social worker with the AFD, Aid for Dependent Children program in DC. And all my clients were black and the power structure of the agency for which I worked was white. Well, I was still going to attempt to recreate that beloved community I had learned that was so vivid in my mind from Mississippi. And uh, I failed. And about six months into the job, I was locked inside the building while the welfare, National Welfare Rights Organization boycotted or marched, demonstrated outside. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was on, on the wrong side and I was uphold, I was hired to uphold institutionalized racism. So I left with those words saying I can't work in this racist institution. And went on to uh, try and find a way to make a living and, and be in the world and ended up back in California in a construction internship in which we learned uh, construction trade, uh, the trades by fixing up the houses of homeowners of modest means. And I thought that was a great thing. There were lots of Vietnam veterans working in that program. And we, I decided while I was working in that program that I am a Vietnam veteran as well. And they agreed with me. We were all because wounded. of your time in the peace movement, the anti-war movement. We were all wounded by that war. Mm -hmm. This country was wounded by that war. Anyway, I took those skills and uh, eventually, uh, eventually started a company and eventually moved to Frederick, Maryland for family reasons. And uh, with another woman started a home improvement company, got my, my contractor's license from the state of Maryland and um, did, did fairly well. Uh, mostly working for county and city programs that uh, that fixed up the homes of poor people, and we enjoyed that. It was very. This is all in Maryland, correct? In in Maryland, mm -hmm. yes. It, it was very satisfying work, except for withholding taxes from your employees, too many of which went to support <laughs> Desert Storm and the Iraq War, and and. Uh, and so uh, that was always the, the less happy part of, of that work. And we didn't try and go big. We didn't try and do fancy. We just did the work that needed doing. And we met many wonderful people, worked for um, black families and white families, and uh, tried to share the, the uh, profits from it as, as equally as we could. Uh, after 9-11, when... Uh, Actually, after Desert Storm, people in Frederick started a Peace Resource Center right downtown, and I got involved with that as a result of Desert Storm and uh, became active in that organization. And uh, when 9-11 happened, and even the people at the Peace Center were silent about are going to war in Afghanistan, it really crushed my spirit. I, uh, I couldn't understand how we could think that was okay. And so uh, we limped along until 2004 when 
we invaded Iraq and it was tax time and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't pay. I couldn't withhold taxes from my employees mm -hmm. who live simple lives to, to fight these foreign wars abroad. So we put down the company in 2004 and uh, since then have enjoyed sailing around on a small boat and being in nature and um, learning how sick Mother Earth and, and her oceans have become and, uh, and the whole idea of the environmental movement, which was always a part of my, my upbringing in Paradise, California and, uh, and throughout my life to live simply and care about nature. So here we are. <laughs> Well, the most recent thing you've been involved with, you should talk about the Venezuela crisis. How have you been involved in that? And explain a little what the issues are there. Well, I had the opportunity in 1999 to go to Cuba with Pastors for Peace. And I saw a socialist country in action. And I saw um, a lot of uh, poverty, but that was, it wasn't poverty of spirit. It was poverty in terms of material goods, the artistic soul and uh, music, the, the music, the artistry, the caring community, I saw that all over again in Cuba. And I, re I recognized that uh, Venezuela had a Bolivarian revolution that was very similar to, uh, to set it up under Chavez in particular, mm -hmm. to set up the same kind of uh, sharing government that uh, Cuba had, socialist. and. Uh, when I learned that Code Pink, who I've admired and uh, joined in many of their uh, demonstrations, and Answer Coalition, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism, the two, <laughs> two things I care most about, um, had joined forces uh, at this Venezuelan, em at the emptied Venezuelan embassy and that they had in been invited by the Bolivarian government to, to occupy that uh, embassy building, I wanted to be supportive of that. And, and their demand was, was basically no U.S. intervention, correct? The, the demand is no U.S. intervention and do not use this embassy to support an illegal queue, coup and the uh, lack of, of law, the lawlessness that the whole thing represents. We have no business going to, to interfere in another sovereign country's uh, domestic affairs. We have uh, nasty sanctions all over the world against everybody we don't, who doesn't march to our tune. And uh, at the Venezuelan embassy, there are very specific laws about how uh, diplomatic, the d rules of diplomatic properties, and we're, we're breaking them right and left. City rules, international conventions, and we, we're, we're just, we've got a lawless government looking for war, is what it seems to me. And the crisis me. is not resolved at all. The Venezuelan crisis is going on still now. We don't know, but you're involved in it. I'm supportive of those who are very bravely um, putting their bodies and lives on the line. And, and I'm joining with them in solidarity, yes. Thank you, Lillian.